Ted Cruz is on the show a couple of weeks ago. I got a chance to ask him a few questions, and he's appearing again today in California as his camp at least recognizes how critical California may become down the road here to the Republican presidential nominations. We're bringing Ted Cruz back on the John and Ken Show. Ted, welcome back. Thank you, gentlemen. Great to be with you. Ted, good to be on with you this time. Uh, missed you last time. The big news of the day, uh, you won in Colorado 34 yep. to nothing over Trump. You got 34 delegates. There was not a single regular vote cast. There was no primary. There's no caucus. Trump is now running around claiming this is rigged. This is corrupt. One of his advisors said that your people were using Gestapo tactics. What's your response to all this? <laughs> Well, it, it is all silliness. Um, we've seen a pattern now with Donald Trump, which, which is that he doesn't handle losing very well. And that when he's losing, he begins yelling, he begins screaming, often he begins cursing, and, and he insults and attacks anyone he can find. Uh, it- here, are the simple, here, here are the simple facts. In the last three weeks, there have been a total of 11 elections all across the country. We have beaten Donald Trump in all 11 elections. Let's go back three weeks ago. The state of Utah. We won 69% of the vote. A landslide won all 40 delegates. Fast forward then to the state of North Dakota. North Dakota had their state convention. They elected their delegates. Of the declared delegates, we won 18 delegates. Trump won only one, 18 to one. That's a, pre- that's a pretty good ratio. Then fast forward to Wisconsin. Wisconsin, all the, ma- the media pundits said Wisconsin was a perfect state for Donald Trump, that Cruz could not win Wisconsin. It was an upper Midwest state, an industrial state, working class, blue collar. Indeed, the day before the election, Donald Trump predicted a big victory in Wisconsin. Well, the people of Wisconsin had something else to say for it. And we ended up winning Wisconsin with 48 percent of the vote, another landslide, beating Donald Trump by 13 points. And then in Colorado, the last week in Colorado, there have been a total of eight elections in Colorado. Seven in each of the seven uh, congressional districts, and then one at their state convention. Those eight elections, as you mentioned a minute ago. What are these? uh, Were these delegate conventions? They were congressional conventions. Congressional conventions. In each of the districts and came and voted for their delegates. At stake were 34 delegates, and we won all 34. A total of about 65,000 people voted in Colorado. So when Donald is screaming uh, about the election being stolen from him, what he means is the people, when they go to the ballot box, are voting against him, and it makes him angry. So but, uh, yeah, most people don't understand how this stuff works. This is all really arcane. So people showed up at these seven uh, congressional conventions to vote for delegates? Correct. There were a whole series of elections, and people showed up, and they elected their delegates. Um, And 34 delegates were elected altogether. We won all 34. Donald Trump won zero. And what he's angry about is that people keep voting against him. I mean, this he's now lost 11 elections in a row in four different states. And it it makes him angry. It makes him scared. And so he strikes out and attacks. but, but, I, but this is I, called I democracy. Yeah, I, 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 no, I understand what you're saying. But obviously, Trump has support in Colorado. It's not like he has 0% support. So is this a matter of you and your uh, campaign team being very smart at managing this delegate process and Trump, Trump's team is completely out to lunch? No, this is a matter of grassroots support showing up and activists showing up and voting. And winning the elections. And listen, it is the case in many states that, that the winner gets all of the delegates, even though, of course, other people have support. You know, in, in South Carolina, Donald Trump got just over 30 percent of the vote. He got 100 percent of the delegates. I mean, that's actually the way the system works. The problem was Donald had eight elections where he could have turned out his supporters, but he didn't have enough supporters to win even a single election. And so he got no delegates and we beat him. Eight times a row in, in in a row in Colorado, just like we beat him in North Dakota, I, just like we beat him in Wisconsin. I, I guess like a lot of Utah. a lot of people like the idea that you have a straight democratic process where people show up on primary day and vote, and the winner wins. But between some of this stuff and certainly the Bernie Sanders situation, it it it's it's looking incomprehensible to the average voter, and people are starting to wonder what's real and do the voters right. really matter in this process. Uh, absolutely. Now, listen, the Democratic side, the Democratic system is rigged. The Democratic system has hundreds and hundreds of what they call these superdelegates, which are party officials that, that ignore ignore the votes of the people. Republican side doesn't have superdelegates. It's only the Democratic Party that has that. 
On the Republican side, the way you win is simple. The way you win is you earn a majority of the delegates elected by the people. Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. And, and it is looking more and more likely that we are headed to a contested convention in Cleveland. And I'll tell you, for the first time in decades, California is going to have a voice. And I think California is going to be pivotal in choosing the Republican nominee. And our support here in California is incredibly strong. I could not be more encouraged by what we're seeing in California. Yeah, because right now, Senator Cruz, you know the states coming up, include New York, where Donald Trump has a sizable lead over you. Following that will be some mid-Atlantic states, some other eastern states. It looks like he could be leading himself to some victories in the coming two weeks. Oh, sure. And, and, and listen, New York is his home state. You would expect Donald Trump to do well in his home state. In my state of Texas, we whipped Donald badly in my home state of Texas. And so, of course, Donald is going to have a lot of support. Everyone expects him to get far over 50 percent of the vote in, in New York, and, and he may well do that. We're competing in New York. I was last week. I was in Brooklyn. I was in the Bronx. We're headed to New York this week. And we're working to pick up some delegates and to earn some support there. But, but of course, he's going to do well in his home state. Uh, even if he does, and even if he picks up a few wins in some of the northeastern states, we're quickly going to shift into states that I think will be very, very favorable for our campaign, states like Indiana, like Nebraska, like Montana, like South Dakota. And then it's all going to come down to California, 172 delegates. And I'll tell you, it's very interesting. There's a website called 538, which is the website that was created by the New York Times' as number crunchers. Now, they're liberals. They're no friends of mine. But they are number crunchers. They look at elections. They're putting the odds of the Cruz campaign winning the Republican primary at 61 percent, roughly two to one over the odds of Trump winning. And that's because of the grassroots support we've got all across the state of California. And, and you, your, your best shot would be to win on a second ballot. If Trump is denied a majority, you are working on being the second choice for a lot of Trump delegates who can switch on that second ballot. Well, that, that's right. And, and if we have a contested convention, which, which is looking more and more likely, what that means is that nobody gets to 1237, which is a majority. And so I will come into Cleveland with a ton of delegates. Donald will come into Cleveland with a ton of delegates. Our names will be the only two names that under the rules will appear on the ballot. And it will be a battle to see who can then earn a majority of the delegates elected by the people. And, you know, one of the easiest ways to understand it is simply to ask, where do the Rubio delegates go? Where do the Kasich delegates go? And I think they come overwhelmingly to us. They don't go to Donald Trump. And so I think we will win a majority of the delegates at the convention. And one of the big reasons is the numbers are clear if Donald Trump is the nominee. Hillary Clinton wins, and Hillary wins big time by, by double digits. On the other hand, if I'm the nominee, we beat Hillary Clinton, and we turn this country around, and that's why so many Republicans are uniting behind our campaign. Let me ask you, uh, last time you were on with Ken, you covered a lot of immigration stuff. Yeah. But there was one aspect that I wanted to get into here. We talk about this a lot. The H-1B visas, mm -hmm. where big business use these visas to get sure. foreigners to come into this country, and then... The Americans who currently have these jobs train yep. the foreigners. Yep. The Americans are fired. And we're talking about, you know, men and women in their 40s and 50s in the middle of their life tossed in the street. And now these foreigners take their jobs, sometimes doing them remotely from, let's say, India. Uh, Disney yep. has done this to yep. in, in an abusive yep. manner. Uh, there's a lot of people in our listening area who've told us all these terrible stories. Are you, are you going to just stop this nonsense if you become Absolutely. president? Absolutely, yes. I, what you're raising is something I'm very, very concerned about. And, now, are I, you going to be I, able to risk, resist, though, all the tremendous big business pressure and lobbying? Because they got a lot of Republicans in Congress in their pocket. They have a ton of Republicans in their pocket. But if you look at my tenure in Washington, the one thing it's demonstrated is that I'm willing to stand up to the career politicians in both parties and to stand up to the lobbyists in order to fight for the hardworking men and women of this country. Indeed, I have pledged as president that we'll put in place a 180-day moratorium on the H-1B program, because this is a program that's being abused, that companies are doing what you said. They're bringing in not high-skilled workers, but medium- and low-skilled workers. They're firing American workers, and, and to add insult to injury, they're forcing the American workers to train their foreign replacements. That is wrong. And we will launch an investigation, an audit of every company that's received H-1B visas. And if they have abused their program, they will be suspended from the program. And if they violated the criminal laws, 
they will be prosecuted because we need a government that fights for the working men and women of this country. And let me point out, this is an issue on which there's a big difference between me and Donald Trump. Donald initially said he would rein in the H-1B program, but then a couple of debates ago, standing on the debate stage, Donald just flip-flopped and said, oh, no, no, now we need to expand the H-1B program. And maybe part of the reason is that Donald Trump is right now one of the people abusing the immigration laws. His resort in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, is bringing in hundreds of foreign workers instead of hiring Americans. And the defense Donald gives is you cannot find Americans willing to work as waiters and waitresses. That is ridiculous. It is wrong. And it's abusive. And as president, I will always, always, always stand with hardworking American workers. All right, Senator Cruz, on another subject, when you were on our show last time, you talked a lot about your belief in religious liberty. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you did attend this National Religious Liberty Conference last year with some other candidates. Will you talk about Pastor Swanson? Uh, Kevin, oh. Kevin Swanson, of course, has called for the death of gay people. Yeah. He, he was an individual I didn't know. I'd never met him. I went to a conference on religious liberty because it is an issue I care very much about. After the conference, uh, his comments were drawn to my attention, and I had denounced them at the time. I think they're wrong. I totally disagree with them. I didn't know this fellow, and when I saw what he said, I came up publicly and said, I, I disagree with what he's saying. We need to be bringing people together, and we need to be standing up for the rights of every American. That's what I've done in the Senate, and that's what I'll do as president. Do you think you're on the wrong side, though, of same-sex marriage, since it looks like more states are embracing it? Well, you... listen, I, I'm a constitutionalist, and, and under the Constitution, marriage is a question for the states. Uh, it shouldn't be five unelected judges in Washington setting public policy for the whole country. If someone wants to change the marriage laws of their state, there's a way to do it under the Constitution, which is you convince your fellow citizens to change the marriage laws. And it may well be that the people of California come to a different decision on that question than the people of Texas or New York or Florida or any other state. And that's the great thing about our Constitution. With, with federalism, with the Bill of Rights, we have 50 states, and each state can adopt laws that reflect the values of the citizens of that state and, and and it shouldn't be Washington. It shouldn't be unelected judges. But isn't marriage so intrinsic and important that we should have a nationwide standard on it? Don't you think? Uh, uh, of course not. And there's no, there are no, no. nationwide marriage laws uh, under the Constitution. Then we should allow the South always... to still segregate and use Jim okay. Crow. But no, of course not, because there is explicit language in the United States Constitution prohibiting racial discrimination. We fought a civil war to end the specter of slavery, to end racial discrimination, and, and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed in the wake of that civil war. We should enforce those amendments vigorously. Bigotry is wrong. But marriage has always been a question for the states, and, and we ought to protect democracy. That's what this is about, is the democratic process. And I believe in the people, and, and empowering the people of California to, to make the determination as to what the marriage laws of California should be without a, a handful of judges in Washington setting aside their choices. Would you mind taking a question from my son, uh, Jordan? He's uh, sure. an editor at his uh, school paper, and he wanted to talk to you. All right, so put Jordan on. Jordan, you're on with Ted Cruz. Hi. Hey, hey Jordan. Um, all right, so moving over to ISIS, you've repeatedly said that um, to deal with them, you would carpet bomb anywhere that they are that ISIS is um, concentrated, but this would likely result in the deaths of thousands of innocent people, including children, and we're supposed to be an example for morality in the international community, but if ISIS kills innocent people and we respond by killing more innocent people, aren't we no better than they are? How is that morally justifiable? Well, Jordan, thank you for that question. It's, it, it, it's a very good question. Let me, let me ask you, where, where are you in, in, in school? Uh, what? I'm sorry. He's uh, he's a senior you're on, a on senior. the west side. Yeah, you're a senior in high school right now. Yes, I am. Well, well, very good. It, it's a very good question. Listen, what I have said is we need to do everything necessary to utterly destroy ISIS, and and that includes using overwhelming air power. Of course, we should not be deliberately murdering civilians. And and let me contrast to, to show you what I mean by overwhelming air power. Take a look at the first Persian Gulf War, which was about 25 years ago. 
In that war, we launched roughly 1,100 air attacks a day. We did saturation carpet bombing. And the effect of that was we did that for 37 days, and then our troops went in and in in a day and a half mopped up what was left of the Iraqi army. 1,100 air attacks a day is devastating. In contrast right now, the Obama administration is launching between 15 and 30 air attacks a day. 15 and 30 compared to 1,100. It, it, right now, what we're doing is pinprick. It's photo op foreign policy, yeah, but, and it's but can, ineffective. But can you eradicate ISIS when they're hiding in civilian neighborhoods? How do you not kill innocent civilians? How is it possible? You, 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 so, so you have to combine multiple tools. You use overwhelming air power, and we use air power to take out their command and control facilities, to take out their communication, to take out... Uh, their transportation, their means of ingress and egress, for example, outside of Cat- Raqqa, where, where, where they're headquartered, to take out their oil fields, to take out the oil refining capacities, to take out their oil transportation, to take out th- their troops and military capacity. Now, it's not just air power. We combine it with arming the Kurds, who are our longtime allies. They are boots on the ground right now, fighting effectively. The Obama administration refuses to arm the Kurds for political reasons. That makes no sense. So when you said and, carpet bomb, you didn't mean carpet bombing all the uh, neighborhoods. No, no, of course not. And, I, and I've made that clear many, many times. It has never been U.S. policy to target civilians. Of course, we're not going to start doing that. W- what I have said is we should use the qualitative air power advantage we have to, to take out ISIS, and that's what Obama is unwilling to do so. But, of course, we're not going to target civilians. That would be morally wrong, and that, that was the basis of your question, so I agree with your question, Jordan. Would you be willing to make every effort to make sure that we hit ISIS and only ISIS and there was minimal collateral damage? Uh, yes, but, but let, me, let me give a qualifier to that. Right now, the Obama administration has such strict rules of engagement uh, that, that it makes it impossible for our fighting men and women to fight and win. Um, It it is an unfortunate consequence of warfare that any time there is warfare, there are collateral damages. There will be civilian casualties. We have always worked to minimize those. We should minimize those. But, But any standard that says you can never have any civilian casualties means you cannot actually fight the war effectively, and, 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 and we need to make sure, if we're sending our sons and daughters, if we're sending our fighting men and women into combat, we need to have rules of engagement that enable them to fight and defeat the enemy. We always work to minimize and avoid civilian casualties, but, but dropping them to zero as a practical matter is, is, is nearly impossible, and we need to focus on defeating ISIS, because every day ISIS grows and gets stronger. Their ability to murder Americans. It is their stated intent to wage jihad, to murder as many Americans as possible. And we've seen in Paris, we've seen in Brussels, and tragically in California and San Bernardino, we have seen that they intend to murder us if they can. And as president, I will defeat them to keep America safe. All right, Senator Ted Cruz, we hope to have you back on again. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for everything you guys do. And, uh, uh, if you guys want to learn more about the campaign, your listeners come to our website. It's tedcruz.org, tedcruz.org, and I look forward to seeing you here in the great state of California. All right. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, Republican candidate for president in California today, campaigning at a couple of rallies and stopping by the Johnny Ken Show.